you would all stand and we'll turn over to page 29. Good morning. Welcome out to church. Good to see everybody this morning. We have a couple uh, prayer requests this morning. Before we uh, start, we have uh, Beth Kingbird, a friend of Pat and Christy Kane's. Uh, we just need to add her to the list for um, personal, for medical also. We have Ron Snell, a uh, friend of Pastor Tom's, that we're, we need to put on here for, for depression and for salvation. We need to put on the list here. Oh, yeah, Eddie told me to put, uh, Ed told me to put uh, Jay, Jen's husband, Jay. He, is he in kidney failure, really? 50%. So, Clegg's did, right? Kerrigan, yeah. And we all and Shirley have a friend uh, that we need to pray for. He's in Eric. He'll be traveling to Africa. We just need to pray for personal safe travels there. Also, I have Alice Brendan, um, Judy's mom, that uh, they got to make uh, Judy pray for a couple things. Probably looking at Alice has to go to into a home. So we need to pray for uh, Judy to make uh, you know some of the t tough decisions and uh, just pray that uh, – she has the strength and uh, to do those, make those tough decisions and pray for Alice that uh, a home would open up for her to get her mom into. Greg Davidson's dad does have cancer. We do not know what stage it is. Um, he's having difficulty breathing on his own, can't get the oxygen levels up, so we need to pray for Greg's dad. Um, Chuck Carlson had passed. Um, service will be Thursday. I think it's at the Cohasset. Community Bible Cohasset, 
So I think it's a church a couple blocks behind here. So I think it's from 11 to 12 will be the social hour, and then 12 will be the service. So Chuck had passed. If you remember Jackie and family in prayer, that would be great. Uh, Lane's daughter, you know, she's got some medical issues going on. Lane wrote me a letter, just asked if we pray for her. And then how's your son-in-law, Shane, his heart? Okay. Mike, Mike Richards. Richards. You want to give everybody out there, Mike Richards? Uh, just a praise report on uh, my cousin uh, Peggy Richards' husband, Mike. Mike was uh, in hospice uh, up until about three weeks ago, and uh, he took himself off. Um, he was ready to, to take his journey to heaven, and um, the Lord intervened. And Mike is uh, received a liver and kidneys, and he's up walking around, walking and talking, and they expect him to make a full recovery. So, praise be to God. So we don't hear enough praise reports, and and um, so that's an amazing answered prayer. We've been praying for uh, this man for a while, Mike Richards. Friend of the cousin of the Foy family, right? Any other prayer requests this morning? Okay, it's open with prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, Father, first of all, we just want to thank you for your grace. We know we don't deserve heaven, but you know what? You sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for the sins of mankind, being buried and rose again the third day, showing us that the payment for sin has been paid in full. And Father, it's just amazing your grace and your mercy and, and, your, and your love that you have for us. You saved us from a hell that we deserve to a heaven we don't when we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. We believe that we are born again. We receive eternal life. And Father, we thank you. We're so thankful for this gift that we receive in Jesus Christ. And Father, it's just, we don't give enough praise report or just uh, say thanks enough. We should give thanks in everything. And we do not probably do that, not in everything, but we should really do give thanks in everything because this man here, Mike Richards, this is, is an awesome answer prayer because we know you hear our prayers. We know you answer our prayers, obviously, to do your will. And ultimately, we just pray that uh, through this through this answered prayer there, Father, through Mike Richards' life here, that uh, the gospel would be furthered because that's what it's all about in Philippians, that everything is to furtherance of the gospel. So that either, either in life or death, that is what it's about. So, Father, we just ask that you'd work in Mike Richards' lives, continue to work in him, that the gospel would be further given. And obviously, we have a living testimony that can give give the glory to you, Father. And we're so thankful for the the extended time, the the extended time that you've given with Mike and his family and the friend and the family, the Foy family there. And it's just a wonderful thing to have answered prayer there, Father. And Father, we pray for Mr. Snelling there, Mr. Ron Snell. We pray for his depression. We know at times life. You know, life becomes apathy, sets in, and just sometimes life is not worth living. And Father, we do pray for the people here in the church here that sometimes people feel that life is not worth living, but ultimately we need to continue to press on, move forward, and ultimately have, have the vision, have the mission to share the gospel, that the light would be shared with others, Father. So we pray that you be with this, this man here and remove his depression from his life there, Father. And we just pray that you'd open his ears and that he would accept Christ Jesus as his Savior there, Father. We pray for Beth Kingbird, friends of the Canes. We just pray that you'd be with her and address her medical needs there, Father. We pray for the Philippine people that continue to come under attack there, and we just pray that they would, you'd continue to keep them safe, build a hedge of protection around them so they can continue to share the gospel there. We pray for the Chuck Carlson family there, Father. We pray that you'd be with Jackie and friends and family, and we pray for Thursday that uh, the gospel would be boldly be given there. And Father, that uh, maybe somebody would get saved through the funeral there, and, and uh, that's, that's what we pray for. We pray for Lane's daughter for medical issues. Lane had asked that we pray, and we do pray for that you'd address her medical needs there, Father, and let her, know, let her dad know that things will be okay. We pray for Shane, that the testing come back and all things will be good there, Father. We pray for Alice Brendan, Judy's mother, mom, and we just pray that you'd open doors there for her to get into a home, a home that matches her needs there, Father, that would take care of her and give her compassion and give her care and, and again, yeah. just identify, treat her needs there, Father. We also pray that you'd be with Judy. We know sometimes we are put into positions and 
family members, uh, you know, sometimes we, we see the true colors come out of people and it's not that we try to please people. Father, we just ask that you'd be with Judy and that she would make the right decisions and ultimately the glory goes to you, Father, and that she can lay her head at night and she knows she's done what's right. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks or says, but ultimately she answers to you, Father. So, Father, we just ask that you give her the strength and courage to do that, which we know she will. We pray for Greg Davidson, whose dad is 48 years old, cancer. Father, we pray that it's stage one. We, we don't know what stage it is, but we pray that it can be curable. We pray that it can be removable. And we just pray that you'd be with Becky and Sam and Tim and Greg and that you continue to give them the assurance that things are going to be okay there, Father. And we just ask that you'd be with Greg Sr., that you keep him pain-free and comfortable. And Father, we just say again, would that be great to have another praise report to remove this cancer from this man. And Father, if there's any other prayers I might have missed, we pray for Jay Kerrigan this morning that uh, we know he's probably a 50% kidney failure reported. We just pray that you'd be with him and that we could get him a kidney there, Father, but you would be with Jay and Jen and their sons there that to give them assurance that their dad and their husband is going to be okay. Father, if there's any other prayer reports I might have missed or prayer requests I missed this morning, you again know the needs and the wants of the people. And Father, we just ask that you'd bless Bless the message to our body in Jesus' name. Amen. Birthdays this week. Tommy. And Ray. I know there's another one too. And Peg. And Peg next. Oh, and John Lake. Deb. Deb. Deb next. Deb next. Hi, John. Your mom's, mom's birthday is today? And she's at work. Steph's at work. Yeah. We'll sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Do we have any anniversaries this week? Okay, we'll turn over to page 255, and we'll sing verses 1 and 4. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast your poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. My heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Page 108. We'll sing all three. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wound inside which flow be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no longer know? These for sin could not atone.
Thou must save and Thou alone. In my hand no price I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. While I draw this final breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown, and behold thee on thy throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Oh, I'm hidden in the rock. I'm sitting. How oh, Moses was in the rock and he put the hand. I was just sitting back there. Oh, I'm hidden in the rock. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Forget what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, a couple of announcements. Majestic Pine service at 11 a.m. this morning. And we also have the Grand Village service with Pastor Tom today, correct? And if you, anybody's welcome to go over there, I know Eddie goes over there. And anybody is always welcome. To, to come out today at Majestic Pines. Uh, we'll be studying Philippians chapter 4 over there. We also have youth group today from 3 to 5. It'll be game night. And if you have a niece, nephew, granddaughter, grandson, son, daughter, please bring them out, neighbor, kid. It'd be great. You can drop them off at 3, pick them up at 5, or and or hang out with us. We're definitely going to be playing some games. If you want to come out and hang out with us, come on out. We we'll welcome the adults also. So... Play some musical chairs, Pictionary, and just to be a good time. Um, we also have some women's announcements. Women's Bible study will start on the 28th, and I believe it's going to be at 12 p.m. at the church, correct? And then we have the Duluth trip, March 7th. We're going to meet at the church. Women are going to meet at the church at 9 a.m. for the carpool. I suppose if you have questions, you can call Rachel. Perfect. I will put those on the announcements. Bible study was great last Wednesday. You know, there are times, Bible study is always good, but last Wednesday was amazing. And uh, uh, just, uh, it was pretty awesome for uh, Herman's granddaughter, Christy, to bring out some friends. And um, Ryan brought a friend, and it was just, uh, it was just a good time. If you were there, it was awesome. And if you weren't, you missed out. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe we'll see you this time, this Wednesday. But it was Really enjoyable. I actually it was it was one of the best ones I was ever attended. Just really nice. We also have uh, Easter service coming up April fifth, and I, there's a we need some play coins, right? Play coins. So not real coins, play coins. So if you got play coins, there's actually going to be a little bucket by the coffee. Yep and um, put the play coins in there. It's going to be for Sir, a, actually a kid's Sunday school that Rachel's doing about paid in full, correct? So we need some fake coins. Anything else I need to announce? Okay, we'll do the last song before the message. Jesus Loves Me, page 226. Yeah, if we can get the kids to come up. The girls can all line up in here. Come on here. We'll put this here so you can read this. We'll need the adults to help too. Can you all read this? We'll sing the first verse. Come on in here. You just do the first verse here. We'll sing it twice.
job, guys. Music was great too. Christy and Kim and Eddie, Blair, Mike. Might as well turn over to Book of Jonah for a little bit. Or we're going to look at Jonah for just a little bit. Today's message is uh, salvation is of the Lord. It's right after Obadiah. Let me read two, chapter two, verse nine. He says, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Let's open prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, again, we know just so, so thankful that salvation is of the Lord. We know that uh, man likes to pervert, pervert the gospel. Man wants, man wants to add things to the redemptive uh, works of Jesus Christ or take away or not even trust in Jesus at all. Man, we have this uh, ecumenalism movement that says there's many pathways to heaven and we know that's completely false and we're so thankful that salvation is of the Lord and uh, it's always been one way to heaven and that is through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that he paid the, the perfect sacrifice. We know the people in the Old Testament were saved just like we are saved today. They're saved by grace through faith. It wasn't the Old Testament that saved them. It was nothing like that or the, uh, the law didn't save them. They looked to the cross. They believed in the coming Messiah. They believed Jesus was going to die on the cross for the sins, be buried, rose again the third day. We look back to the cross, saved the same way. It is by grace through faith, and salvation is of the Lord. And Father, we're so thankful for that, that we, we can gather here today and study that and read that for ourselves and, and ultimately know that we can trust God, that we don't have to trust man or believe what man says, but to trust you and what you say read your wonderful words of life here today. And we're so thankful for that, Father. So, Father, again, we just ask that you bless the word to our body. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've all heard of the story of Jonah and the great fish. But what does the Bible say about Jonah? You know, maybe we've all heard of the story of Jonah and the whale, but it doesn't really say the whale. And um, so, again, what does the Bible say about Jonah? The Lord came unto Jonah and told him to go to Nineveh. And it's interesting, if you look, if you get out a map, and if you look where Nineveh is, it's located by present-day Mosul. And we've heard of Mosul in Iraq. We've heard of this city, Mosul, for as part of the U.S.-Iraqi war, and when the U.S. troops pulled out, that is when ISIS, or ISIL, moved in, and currently Iraqi rebels, uh, I believe at this time, have pushed out ISIS, ISIL, out of Mosul. But it, it was obviously at one time under attack there by ISIS, ISIL. And I even heard people say that Nineveh, was, Nineveh is probably the present day, um, or it's by there, I guess, by Mosul. So it wasn't the present day Mosul, it was be by the old Nineveh. ISIS, ISIL means Islamic State or Ira of Iraq and Syria. So we've heard a lot about that, but clearly that is the place where obviously God told Jonah where to go. So anyway, Jonah was called to go to Nineveh instead of going east. If you read Jonah 1 there, he goes directly west. Absolutely opposite, not fulfilling what the Lord had asked him to do. Jonah gets on a ship, and he sails for Tarshish. And some say Tarshish is in Italy, or even Spain, and ultimately I believe it's probably Spain. So Jonah was told to go to the present-day Iraq, go to Mosul, go to Nineveh, and instead he sets sail for Spain. He goes in the complete opposite direction. 
While on the ship, the Lord sends out a great wind and a mighty tempest to the sea, the point where the ship was destroyed. So it's almost going to be destroyed. And everyone on board was terrified and started to pray to their gods, yet nothing happened. So let's read Jonah 1 here. We'll read this quickly. He says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amat. Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and criest it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and found a ship going to Tarshish. And he said to the fairer thereof, and went down into it, and go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried even every man unto his God and cast forth the waters wares that were, uh, were in the ship into the sea. Obviously they lightened the load and lightened it of them, but Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto them, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country? And what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of the heaven, which had made the sea and the dry land. Obviously telling them he's the God that can cure this tempest. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee that sea, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was temptuous. Ultimately, we see a couple problems in here. We have a man who flees in the opposite direction. So as a believer here, you know, we have a lordship salvation message today that People are saying, if your life doesn't show that you're saved, you're probably not saved. Well, Jonah obviously was clearly a documentation here of a, against lordship salvation. Your life should look like. It doesn't have to. But again, I would ask, what does that obviously look like? And these preachers, these pre preachers or teachers that say, you're, if you're saved, your life will look at it. We have a prophet of God that ran the opposite way. We have a prophet of God that actually was sleeping during a tempest. And we have a pagan man that comes to him when he's sleeping. And we have a pagan man calling upon the prophet to call upon God. I mean, you, this guy is completely out of fellowship. But ultimately, what happens here? If you continue to read on 112 through 2 there to, to 210, we won't read it. But Joni ultimately says, cast me overboard. And these pagan men, they ultimately... They didn't want to do that, and they prayed, and ultimately they didn't want the blood to be on their hands, but they ended up, and ultimately had to do that. They threw Jonah overboard, and the sea stopped raging, and ultimately a great fish that was prepared ultimately swallowed up Jonah. So Jonah was drowning and ultimately swallowed by a great fish, and while he was drowning, he swallowed by a great fish. He prays. And later, the fish vomits him on the shore alive. We know that over in John or Jonah 2.10. Later, Jonah goes to the city of Nineveh, and he preaches to the people. And they believed God, the city. That would be Jonah 3.5. It says, so the people of Nineveh believed God. They were saved. They believed in the coming Messiah. So jo Jonah, he is disappointed. So let's get to the moral of the story here. Jonah is disappointed. He wanted the Ninevites destroyed. He actually did not want these people to be saved. Again, <laughs> the heart of a prophet, he did not want these people to be saved. He wants destruction over the city. And he goes up on a hill to watch the city hopefully be destroyed. And during this, line, this, this time, the Lord prepares a gourd, a pumpkin or whatever you want to call it, a squash, a gourd for him to block the sunlight. And Jonah was happy. Later, the Lord prepared a worm that ate the gourd, and Jonah was angry. Jonah was more concerned with his material things, more concerned with himself than people's salvation. That's the story of Jonah. Salvation is of the Lord. Wants all people to be saved. Jonah knew the Lord was gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and great kindness. He says that in, verse, in chapter 4. 
But ultimately, you know, Jonah 2.9 is the greatest verse here, and it is the theme of the Bible. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I, that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So what is the meaning of the story of Jonah? People would say when they hear the story of Jonah, they'll say, oh, it's a great story about a man that got swallowed by a whale. And I would say it's not a story about Jonah. It's a story about a Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. How he worked with the Ninevites. You're talking of a Gentile pagan country, a pagan area that had obviously multiple gods. And he took this one man and he worked and he provided salvation. He wanted them to know that Christ was going to die for all of these pagans. And ultimately they believed God. And I would look at 1 Timothy 2.4. And this is the heart of God who will have all men to be saved. And to come under the knowledge of truth. And how do men get saved? They must believe the gospel. If you look at Ephesians 1.13, it says, In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And we're going to get into the gospel here, but there's a story here for Jonah for us. Do we run the opposite way? When the opportunity to share the gospel, when the, we know there's, there are people that are going to hell every day with their sins paid for, do we run the opposite way? Do we jump ship? Do we go down, run down to Joppa and jump ship and head to Tarshish? Or do we sit under our gourd and how, you know, we're, we're more concerned about how I feel and our material things, and ultimately when the worm comes, then we get mad at God and say, how can you take away my gourd? How can you take away my house? I think there's a very valuable lesson for us that are saved, the importance of getting out there and sharing the gospel. Because there are lost people all around us. So how men do, how, how do people get, get saved? What do we must preach to them? It says in Ephesians 1.13 again, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth. So they have to hear it. The gospel of your salvation. In whom else after that you believed, you are sealed. So the Holy Spirit comes after you believe. So the question is, what is the word of truth? What is the gospel of salvation that are talking about in Ephesians 1.13? If you turn our Bible over to John chapter 14, you'll see what is truth. John 14.6, he says, John, Jesus said unto them, I am the way. The truth. So verse Ephesians 1.13, it says, In whom all you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. Obviously, after you heard about Jesus Christ, he is truth. He is life. And no man come to the Father but by me. We read this every week, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. He says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died according died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The gospel is Christ died for the sins of mankind, Christ was buried, and Christ resurrected the third day. We have a living Savior today that sits at the right hand of God. And all one has to do to go to heaven is believe the gospel. Believe that Christ died on the cross for our sins and he was buried and rose again the third day. That's it. Yet people go to hell rejecting that. And we have a responsibility to share that with people. Be not the heart of Jonah and run the opposite way, wishing people to be judged. And he was a prophet of God. But the Bible is very clear how one gets saved and how one does not. If you've not turned it over there, and I, uh, if you please turn over to Ephesians chapter two. verse 8 and 9. It says, For by grace are you saved. You don't deserve it. Through faith. Saved through faith. It's the object. What are you putting your faith in? Everybody puts their faith in something. Even the agnostic, even the atheist puts their faith in nothing. Nothing would be something. Everybody puts their faith in something. The object is, what are you putting your faith in? Are you putting your faith in? in the object of Jesus Christ, in the finished works of Jesus Christ. So what are you trusting in? 
Does everybody trust in something? For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it's no longer you're trusting in anything that I'm doing. It's not my baptism, it's not my good works. It is a free gift, a gift of God, not a works as any man should boast. When we get to heaven, if there was anything, if I had to trust in my baptism, obviously it's contradictory to the word of God because it's not a works as any man should boast. We will be in heaven and we'll all boast and we'll be given to the glory of Jesus Christ because he has done it all. So saved by grace through faith, not saved by yourself. Salvation is a gift, freely received in Jesus Christ, not saved by works. Not your faithfulness that saves you because we believe there are people that preach and tell you, you got to believe and you got to keep being faithful. That would be a work. It's a trusting, a one-time belief in the finished works of Jesus Christ. You believe one time you're saved for eternal. You step from death unto life, John 5, 24. So if you're sitting here today and you're trusting in your works to save you, if you're trusting in your baptism, your good deeds, or anything else other than the only thing, only el anything else other than and only in the finished works of Jesus Christ, you're not going to heaven. You're going to hell. Don't trust in earthly things to get you to heaven. Don't trust in baptism, communion, good works, feeling bad for sin, becoming a member of a certain organization, but trust in heaven things to get you to heaven. Think about that. Man preaches today, trust in earthly things to get you to heaven. They think you can walk down to the river over here or you can get some bathtub and you get dunked in the water, earthly water, earthly things that will actually give you heavenly things. Doesn't that sound foolish to trust in earthly or man-made things to get you to heaven? That is foolish. The only thing that will get you to heaven is heavenly things, which are trusting in Christ Jesus, his death payment on the cross, and his resurrection. I want you to turn over to Philippians 3.18 because it tells us that exact same thing. Philippians 3.18 and 19. Ultimately, Paul speaking to the church of Philippi here. You need to be wary of enemies of the cross. But what do they preach? He says in 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you, even weepings. He's praying to the church of Philippi. He's crying that they not get caught up into this. That they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction, eternally separated from our Heavenly Father. Whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, and whose mind is earthly things. Enemies of the cross are people who preach anything else than the blood of Jesus Christ. Enemies of the cross are people who preach works for salvation. Enemies of the cross are people who add anything to the redemptive works of Christ Jesus, or take away the redemptive works of Christ Jesus. Remember, salvation is of the Lord. He says how a person is saved and not saved. People trusting in earthly things to get them to heaven, they have their bellies, be their gods. They trust in their physical works and these things that should embarrass them or shame them, they glorify in them. And ultimately, in the end, will bring them destruction. And I would say, be not like these individuals that trust in earthly things for salvation, but remember salvation is of the Lord. And the only acceptable payment for sin is the finished works of Jesus Christ. Let this hand here represent you and I, and this wallet here represents our sin. God loves us, hates our sin, hates it. If you want to reject the redemptive works of Jesus Christ, salvation is of the Lord. If you say, I'm going to get baptized, we know that's not scriptural. If you say, I'm going to ask Jesus into my heart, that's not scriptural. If you say, I'm going to you know, join a church, you know, or I'm going to turn from my sin, or I'm going to confess my sin just before I die, you will die in your sins because salvation is of the Lord. He's the one that says who's going to heaven. And if you want to go to heaven, it is through the blood of Jesus Christ. So instead of trusting in earthly things, why not trust in heavenly things? Let this hand here be Jesus Christ. He is God from eternity past. And he humbled himself as a man. He left his, his glorification in heaven. He didn't leave his deity for he's God. He reveals himself in the flesh and his name is Jesus Christ. He is a gift from heaven. 
And he goes to the cross and he actually he, he sheds his blood and he dies and he resurrects the third day showing us the payment for, for sin has been paid in full. And only God could pay a perfect sacrifice. And why not trust in heavenly things to get you to heaven? That makes sense. Don't let your belly be your God. Don't be full, so filled with pride and think, you know what, I can do it on my own. No, there's a reason why Christ come. He come to die for you and I. And when you believe that, when you trust in that, you receive the righteousness required. It has been put to your account. It's been imputed to you. You receive the righteousness needed to get to heaven. And that is the righteousness that is in Jesus Christ. So again, I want to just clarify about Jonah. I think people say, people say if you're not living a certain lifestyle, if you're not saved, if you are, if you're, if you're not living a certain lifestyle, they say you're not saved. And obviously, I would say that's completely inaccurate. That's a Calvinistic approach. It is definitely what some evangelical churches preach today, and that is a false message. Jonah is an example of doing exactly the opposite of what the Lord wanted him to do. And we see this with believers today. Today there is a damnable message, and again, it is being preached. It's called Lordship Salvation. That says if you're saved, your life will look a certain way, and that is not accurate, for there are many stories in the Bible that show us believers disappointing, disobeying their father and acting out. Now, did I say there wouldn't be consequences? I would No, I did not, for the Bible is very clear. You'll be chastised. And Jonah was chastised. Now we'll be discussed in grace living. So if you're not saved, again, we always say this is probably part of the message is not for you. This is for believers. It's for people that are born again. They've trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And now it's time to grow up in Christ. And then maybe there's people that don't want to hear about grace living. And they want to live a life like Jonah. They want to run completely opposite the wrong direction from our Heavenly Father. And it's your dad in heaven. And maybe people say, you know what, I don't want to hear about pre the, the grace living preaching. And, you know, they get mad at me. And I would say, you know what, take it up with your Heavenly Father. Because grace living is in the Bible. We would have to rip out all the epistles. Because they're written to the church. It's written to believers. It's written to you and I. That's why it's important we study the Word of God. So again, now that you're saved and have a Heavenly Father, you should want to please your dad in heaven. However, I know believers can have the same attitude as Jonah. So I would encourage you to not have the same attitude as Jonah and have the heart of Paul. A desire to please his Heavenly Father. A desire to share the gospel with others. To grow up in Christ. And how do we do this? It starts with transforming our mind. So let's go to Romans chapter 12. And we're going to talk about gifts today, or what some gifts aren't. And we're not going to rush through chapter 12 here because there's a lot of information that we need to talk about. So Romans 12, 1, he says, I beat you, beseech you, I beg you therefore, brethren, brothers and sisters of Christ, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul's pleading. He's begging for the believers in Christ. He's pleading with the brethren that their life be a picture of a living sacrifice. Paul says is, is, that is a reasonable service. That is what the Lord wants from, from his children. Your conduct should be as of the gospel. And we went into this a lot last week. We probably won't go into it a lot this week. Romans 12, 2 says, and Be not conformed to this world. Last week we talked about the three enemies. We talked about the world, Satan, and the, our old nature. And I think our old nature is probably our biggest enemy. And be not transformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that is good, acceptable, perfect will of God. And I would say be not like Jonah and more concerned with your physical needs versus the spiritual needs of others. First thing we are not to do is be conformed to this world. We should not be like this world. 
The world focuses on self, but we live in we live in a very selfish world today. Have a mindset of a servant, for we are to decrease so he can he so he can increase. That would be John three thirty. But I like Philippians one twenty seven. If you turn over to Philippians one twenty seven. Paul writing to believers here, so these people are already saved. This, and ultimately, it's up to you. But there's nothing better to have fellowship with our Heavenly Father. And this is what he's telling us in Philippians 1 and 10, 127. He says, let your conduct, let your conversation, let your conduct be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. That you stand fast in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So let your conduct be as the gospel. And I was thinking about this. How do we, it's hard to picture that. But I get it, but it's hard to sometimes explain. An example of this I, you know, I was thinking is, is Jesus Christ. See, he's the living word, which matches the written word. So our life should be an example to the written word, which is striving forward to furtherance the gospel. So ultimately, when we give the gospel, we have some credibility in our life. So what does the mindset of a servant look like? So stay in Philippians, and we'll look at chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. What does the mindset of a servant look like? Philippians 2, 1 through 8. So if there be, therefore, any comfort in Christ, if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, of bowel, any bowels and mercies, ultimately reminding us we receive comfort from Jesus Christ, receive love from Christ Jesus, and we have fellowship with Christ Jesus through the Spirit, and we experience his tender mercies and compassion. It's Philippians 2, 2, he says, Fulfill ye my joy that ye may be like-minded, like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, one mind. Bring joy to Paul and ultimately God, if we could strive together to have one mind, the mind of Christ, striving together to have one purpose, the purpose to share the gospel, for sharing the gospel is love, and Christ Jesus demonstrated his love for us by going to the cross of Calvary. Verse 3 and 4, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Let not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So ultimately, it would be getting your mind off yourself and onto others. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Having the same mind, mind as Christ Jesus was, which was Christ Jesus dying for the sins of mankind. That same mindset, ultimately not us going and dying for people and resurrecting. That's not what we're talking about. This, but, but a mindset is that you have a desire to share the gospel with them. That they're dead in their sins. And ultimately, if they die, they're going to hell. We should have that desire that Christ went to the cross and he paid for all the sins and he resurrected to show us that. We should have that same desire that we could share that gospel with people. Philippians 2, 6, 8, he says, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now that is the mindset of a servant. Christ obediently, Christ Jesus willingly dying for mankind and not just dying an ordinary death, but the death of the cross, which is dying for the sins of mankind. That is the servant's mindset. This is a great example of not having the mind of the world, but allowing the Holy Spirit to transform your mind by reading the Word of God and ultimately over time, your mind, my mind, be transformed by the word of God, to have the mindset of Christ, which is a servant's mindset. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. He says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So remember, for I say, through the grace given unto me, remember, grace is given unto you. You don't deserve heaven, for you are a sinner saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. 
Be cautious not to have an inflated view of yourself is what Romans 12, 3 is telling us. And we accept these gifts by faith later on when we get down to 6, 7, and 8. Do not oppose the gifts and do not take responsibility for the gifts would be the mindset. 12, 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Each member of the body has a specific gift. Your gift is not more important than mine, and mine is not more important than yours. 12.5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one to another. You are positioned in the body, and the body is not made to serve self. That's what we're seeing here. The body is not made to serve self, but the members of the body are to serve the body, others, to reach out to other believers when they're in time of need, that the body can maybe reach out and share the gospel with others. The grace gifts that we will be speaking about are grace gifts that come from God, and it is important to not have an inflated view of self, for we did not produce these grace gifts, but they were given from God. So before we get into the grace gifts, we should discuss what gifts are not given today. For they were given during the apostolic era and come to an end when the Bible was complete. I'll give you an example. I did a funeral a few days ago, weeks ago, and a man said when he got baptized, he came out of the water and he immediately was speaking in tongues. And we hear today a lot about tongues. And he said, I scared myself, and I said, I'd probably be scared too. Seriously. But let's talk about some of the signs. We see today, you can Bible believe by Ronnie Hines, always makes a joke about, you know, he always makes a joke. He says, uh, we should start selling prayer cloths because you can go online and buy prayer cloths. A man prayed over them and they have healing power and for $20 you could buy a prayer cloth and maybe be healed. It's ridiculous. And people are making a lot of money off people. And I make fun of it. But ultimately, it needs to be pointed out that it's not accurate. So let's talk about what are the apostolic era, the gifts during this time, and we will discuss what are gifts for this time. Because many people are confused on this. Healing, laying of hands, speaking in tongues, handling poisonous snakes, drinking poison. When was this time given? So turn over to Mark chapter 16. One thing we need to remember, the Bible was not complete during this time. And the Bible did not complete probably until 95 or right around 100 AD. Revelations did not get completed. John did not write the book of John, 1st or 2nd, 3rd John, and or the book of Revelations until probably 95 AD. Not till those books were complete. Ultimately, there obviously had to have some signs. That's what was given here. The apostolic era. So let's read Obviously, this time of the first century church, Mark 16, verse 17 and 18. He says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and they shall drink and deadly thing. It shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So the signs at this time were casting out devils speaking in tongues. They handled poisonous serpents and did not die when they got bit. They drink poison and did not die, and they ultimately healed the sick. These gifts were given to the apostles and the believers during this time, the, the time of the apostles. So the reason I can say that is because of Hebrews chapter 2. If you turn over to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Says, how shall we neglect? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. So the apostles here sharing the gospel. Confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Who heard him? The apostles. 
God also hearing, bearing them witness, both with signs. So he gave these apostles signs and wonders with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his will. If you look at 2 Corinthians 12, 12. And that was his will. It was the will of, of these gifts and wonders to be given during the apostolic era. Second Corinthians 12, 12. If you look at first Second Corinthians 12, 12, Paul has a thorn, thorn in his side. Nobody knows what the thorn is. But he prays. And we're already looking at right around 60 AD with 2 Corinthians. And Schofield marks it as 57 AD. There's a couple things that are already happening. So we're already coming to the end, probably where, where gifts are starting to cease. Because Paul actually has a thorn in his own side. He can't even heal himself. He goes to uh, verse 8. He says, For this thing I besought there the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And the Lord said, He said unto me, My my grace is sufficient for thee. This man actually got bit by a poison snake on Malta, and he didn't die. This man healed. He raised people from the dead, and he couldn't even heal himself at this time. But ultimately, verse 12, so 2 Corinthians 12, 12 tells us this. Truly the signs of an apostle were, were performed, past tense, among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So now I want you to turn a couple pages back to the left, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 10. We'll look at 8, 9, and 10. Because ultimately the Bible tells us that these things were going to end at one time. They were going to cease. So look at 1 Corinthians 13, 8. He says, charity never faileth, so love's never going to die. But whether there be prophecies... They shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect. And now the reason they say the word perfect, because perfect is a non-feminine, non-masculine word. And it means an object. People will say that means Jesus Christ when he comes back. No, it's the Bible. And there's much debate on it, but you can look it up in the Greek. It's non-masculine and it's non-feminine. It is an inadded, it's a neutered word, which has to mean the Bible. And that's what the scholars say. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. So when the Bible's complete, these things shall cease. Now I'm going to turn over to Philippians 2.27, because you'll actually see Paul with, with Epaphroditus. He can't even heal his friend. And I think it's important to know these little things like this. Philippians 2.27, if you start up there in verse 25, he says, Let, Yet I suppose it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, companion, labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he ministered to me my once, for he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that you had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, near unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Paul could not heal Epaphroditus in, in uh, 60 AD. So these things were already coming in to an end already in 60, 60, 57, 60 AD, 65 AD. So we look at the healing and casting out devils. If you want to read this, you can. And it's, I'll give you the chapters. And it's Matthew chapter 10, Mark chapter 6. And Luke chapter 9 and 10 are all about the 12 and ultimately the 70. There's the 70. In Luke chapter 10, it says he sends out the 70. So the apostolic gifts were not just for the apostles. There are others confirming Mark chapter 16, verse 17, 18, 17, 18. There were others that had these. And Luke 10 talks about the 70 because they healed the sick that they're in, and they say unto them, the kingdom of God has come near unto them. And we know in Mark 6, 13, and they cast out many devils, anointed with oil many that were sick. So again, this was during the apostles, the apostolic era, and it is not a time for today. 
So let's also now. So that is what they did with the healing. And we don't see it in the in the epistles there, but let's look at Acts chapter two for tongues. Because tongues is spoken three times in the Bible, and we have people that will build a complete denomination around it. It's used in Acts 2, Acts 10, and Acts 19. And the debate has always been, is it a language or is it a babble? Today it is a babble. People use, when they, when they, they use, they speak in tongues, it is a babble. But let's see what the Bible says it is. Acts 2, verse 4. So we're at Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection. And we know the apostles had it, but they were, the Holy Spirit was blown into them. They received it. But ultimately, we see 120. We see about 3,000, then 5,000, I think it was. People get saved at this time. So we look at verse 4. So you had many different people there. Different nations. So here we're in verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Ability to speak is utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Why do you think that's there? So we know that there were Spaniards there and there were Russians there and there were people from South Africa there. Many nations, every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad and the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. How can you misinterpret the word of God? They heard them speak in their own language. So when Peter's giving the message there, you had people in Russian, South African, Lithuanian, Zimbabwe, you know, uh, Nigeria, they all heard in their own tongue. It wasn't a babble. It was a language. And they were amazed, marveled, saying, one to one, behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? These are a couple fishermen from Galilee. They, could, they got an accent. You could tell them that they're from the Door Lake area or Wirt area. They have this accent that they have. And there's a couple loggers. There's a couple fishermen from this area. And it's these guys doing this? And how here we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we are born. And it goes on to list the language they spoke in Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. They heard them speak in their own language. They heard them in their own language. Tongues today is a babble, and it is not tongues of the Bible. Tongues in Acts chapter 2 were to spread the gospel to other nations. There's a reason why these things were used. Look at Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius and Peter. Sharing the gospel with the Gentiles here. We'll look at Acts 10, 44 through 48. So yet Peter spoke these words. The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, Jews, which believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues. And magnify God and answered Peter. So we know they spoke in a language. Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Acts 2, X, and let's finish reading. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry, obviously to tarry certain days. Wait there for a little bit. But Acts 10, 44 through 48, there's a couple lessons here. Like the, the people that say, you know, you get the Holy Spirit when you get baptized. You have scripture right here that, that obviously defeats that thinking. And we have churches today that ultimately say, you got to get baptized. You can believe, but you got to get baptized. And it is when you get baptized, so like the man told me at the funeral, that's when you get the Holy Spirit. 
That is false. The process of getting the Holy Spirit never changes. It is when you believe, that is when you get the Holy Spirit. Peter here confirms that. This, these men believed. They got the Holy Spirit. They seen it. Then he went and baptized them. The process doesn't change. But anyways, if you read Acts 10, 34 through 43, you'll see Peter's giving the gospel to the Gentiles. See, there was a great debate at the time. Did the, the Jews figured the Gentiles didn't get saved like they got saved. They thought it was special to them. Or they said, well, maybe there was a great debate in Jerusalem that they needed to get circumcised before they could get saved. So this here is a sign to the Jews. It was a sign to the Jews that the Gentiles got saved just like they got saved by believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins. He was buried, rose again the third. It is a sign to the Jew. And then it was no longer needed. It was documented. It never happened again. So Gentiles speak in a language they couldn't before speak. And it is a sign to the Jews that Gentiles get saved the same way. It was a sign to the Jews that the Gentiles did not need to get circumcised to be saved. Then there's the last one. It's Acts 19, 1 through 7. Twelve men. Paul speaking to him. At Ephesus. And he says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Question mark. And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be an Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Undo. What then were you baptized? And they said unto John the ba John baptism. So we figure, if you go back to verse one, Apollos, Apollos probably baptized these guys, but obviously he obviously they did not they were not saved, and it confirms this. So Paul then goes on to give them the gospel. Then Paul said, John barely baptized you with the baptism of repentance. Obviously it was a picture of the coming Messiah, what he was going to do. Recognize that you're a sinner, that you believe that Christ is going to die, he's going to go to the belly of the earth, and that he's going to rise again. That's all it was as a picture. He was an old, John the Baptist was an Old Testament prophet that reached into the New Testament pictures. And ultimately, these people got baptized basically in the, John, in the name of John the Baptist. They did not believe in the, name of the, in the name of Jesus Christ. They did not believe that Christ died on the cross for his sins. That's why they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Then said Paul, John, verily baptized with baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. They never heard that part of the message. So when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. And when Paul had his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied, obviously confirming that they were saved, showing again the process of salvation. So 12 men that were baptized by water, and they did not believe in the judge. Christ Jesus' death payment for sin and resurrection. They did not have the Holy Spirit. Once Peter explained the plan of salvation to them, they believed they received the Holy Spirit. This again confirms one must believe in Christ Jesus' death payment for sin and resurrection. So what people get confused about, they think they got to get baptized in some of these evangelical churches today to get the Holy Spirit. Clearly they haven't read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 12 and 13. So if you please turn over to that. You get the Holy Spirit when you believe. You're sealed by it. You can grieve it, but it will never go from you. How do you get it? You don't call on it. You don't ask for it. It's something that naturally happens. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as... The body is one and hath many members. That's us. And all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew, Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. We're baptized 
and to the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit when we believe. Again, Acts 2, 10 confirms this. Those are the only three times that the Bible speaks of tongues. I think 1 Corinthians will talk about the out, kind of the outline of tongues there in 1 Corinthians 12. I think it's 12 and 13 where it talks more about it. But ultimately, the examples given in Acts 2, 9 and 10, or 2, 10 and 19, are all about the gospel, the furtherance of the gospel, showing when people get saved, they get the Holy Spirit. Baptism never brings the Holy Spirit. So the gifts during the apostolic era will end when Paul confirms this. And Paul confirms it in 1 Corinthians 13, 10. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. So before we end here, I want to end on this. So when the Bible is complete, these things shall cease. These signs are no longer needed, for we have the written words of God. And I will ask you this question today. What is more important today, signs or the written word of God? Turn over to John chapter 20. Jesus answers that question for us. John 20, 29 to 31. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. What's more important, signs or what's written? Look at 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's Yahweh. He's Jehovah. Yahshua is salvation. He is Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his name. So more important than anything is the word of God. For these things are written that you might believe Jesus is the Christ. Believe Christ Jesus died on the cross for sins. He was buried and rose for you. Today there are people that preach. Once you get baptized, you come up speaking in tongues by the Holy Spirit. And this shows us they are trusting in their baptism to save them. Because they think they get baptized, that's when they get the Holy Spirit. That is not accurate. Water baptism does not give you the Holy Spirit. And tongues is never a babble that some churches speak today, for we know tongues no longer exist. We know by reading Acts 10, 44 through 48, the process of salvation, getting the Holy Spirit is when you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross. And when you believe that, you receive the Holy Spirit. Once you believe the gospel of salvation, you get the Holy Spirit sealing in you until the day of redemption, guaranteeing your inheritance into heaven. Perfect. I got like one more minute. So here's a question to all the believe, believe in science today. I have a question for them. Why does everyone peak, pick speaking in tongues? I have, yet, I have not yet found a man, a person that says he or she handles deadly snakes and gets bit and nothing happens. I have not met one yet. I have not yet met a person that drinks deadly poison and nothing happens. I have yet met a person walking through the, through the cancer ward at a hospital down at the Mayo, St. Luke, St. Mary's, going through the kids and healing people today. I have not met yet one. I don't see people standing out in front of the emergency room when people come and healing people. People will say they have these signs that were given during the apostolic, apostolic era and use them to deceive people. They use them to rob people of their money. And I would say shame on these people for their fakes. They are pretenders and do much damage for the emphasis is not on Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit doesn't come to reveal himself and glory himself. The Holy Spirit comes to give glory to Jesus Christ. And I will end with John chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. Because the Bible says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that ye shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify of me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. The Holy Spirit speaks of Jesus Christ. The 
The question is, does God heal today? Yes, he does. He doesn't need me to lay hands on people. He doesn't need me to pray over a prayer cloth and then sell it for 20 bucks. What are we to do today? We're to pray. For I can tell you there's not enough praying these days and a lot more theater in these buildings we call churches. There are gifts. They are called grace gifts, and we will be reviewing them next week. Let's close. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, again, we're just so thankful for Jesus Christ. We're so thankful that you sent your son to die on the cross for the sins of mankind, be buried, rose again the third day, showing us the payment for sins and paid in full. And Father, we're thankful that we have the written word of God that will show us when man wants to confuse us, Satan wants to deceive us, and our old nature wants to be prideful in thinking that we have these special gifts. It's clearly the word of God telling us these gifts were given during an era, during a time, during the apostolic era, until the Bible was complete. But when the Bible was clean, complete, there was no need for the signs anymore. What's more important is the wonderful words of life, that we can read it ourselves, see it ourselves, for faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. That is far more important. And Father, we know that tongues is a spoken language. And we thank you for the book of Acts chapter 2 for telling us that. And we know that Acts chapter 10 was a sign for the Jew that the Gentile gets saved by grace through faith. They didn't have to go back under the law. They didn't have to be circumcised or anything like that. And we thank you for this amazing book, the, the wonderful words of life, that we can find the truths ourselves. For we know that the world and Satan wants to trick or use trickery and get us caught up in the mysticism and, and, and all of this, some of this feel-goods type of message. We need to obviously decrease ourselves so he can increase having the mindset of Jesus Christ. Getting our mind off, uh, off of ourselves and onto others is the mindset. Sharing the gospel with others. So Father, we just ask that you be with the people today. And Father, we just ask that you be with Pastor Tom and myself as we go to the nursing home today. And we have a youth group. We pray that you'd bring many kids out. Many families would come out. We pray for safe travels for these kids. We pray for the gospel you've spoken to these kids. We pray for us to have fun on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And Father, we're just so thankful for everybody. We just ask that you be with the people today. In Jesus' name, amen. I know I went on far over. Apologize, but if... But felt we could... Might as well get through it all.